Good morning, wherever you're at right now. Uh, my name is Brian Knight. My email address is on your screen right now. This is a little myself. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the founder of Pragmatic Works, and I was an MVP for about 14 years and authored about, authored about 16 books around the SIS space and uh, BI space in general. One of my latest things I've been working on mostly, though, is Power Apps. Power Apps is one of those really cool things you can do inside of technology that really adds a whole slew of value. So imagine, imagine if you will, once upon a time, there was an organization much like yours, and it was struggling with mountains of paperwork. And you wanted to go through and, and find out what their idea of going digital was to go potentially PDFs. And you know, paperwork's being filled out, going to people's desk, and just disappearing. Well, that's what Power App's job is going to be all about. And that's what we're going to show you today is, is how to fix that mountain of paperwork and how do you convert that paperwork into internal applications that your organization can use that increase accountability and also make things a lot more automated than they are today. So that's the goal of today's presentation. So there's, there's two types of apps that we can do in Power Apps, and we're going to focus on... Oops, we're going to focus on one of those types. I went a little too far there. So there's two types of apps in Power Apps. And Power Apps is part of the Power Platform, pla Power Platform platform that Microsoft has. So chances are you are, if you have Office 365, you already have a license to it today, potentially. Uh, if you have, you might have a, a license called Power Apps for Office. So that's the, the base plan that gives you access to things called Canvas applications. And Canvas applications look like, like the screenshot you're seeing on the screen right now where you have pixel perfect kind of control of the application. Everything works on the phone, works on, a, on a any kind of device out there, and you get WYSIWYG kind of development. So Power Apps for Office is included in Office, your Office description probably. 90% of the time it probably is. Now, once you want to go to the next level up, that's a P1 plan, a plan one. Now that gives you access to things like premium connectors. You're still inside a Canvas application, that pixel perfect kind of control, but it gives you access to premium connectors that you only have access in that plan one. It also has access to other things as well that are a little more premium as well, but the biggest differentiator is the premium connectors, like things like Salesforce, and it's something called the common data services, which we'll cover a lot today. The last plan is called plan two. Now, this difference, I believe the plan one is about seven or eight dollars. I don't know the exact pricing right now on the top of my head um, uh, per user. Uh, now, chances are you can get that license in another packages and you're probably not paying seven or eight dollars. Uh, the other plan is called plan two. Now, this is included if you have Dynamics 365 in many cases. Uh, plan two, the major difference there is, of course, the premium connectors, but you also have the ability to build model driven applications. And that's what we're gonna to discuss today. The Canvas applications, we have another webinar on that. We did about, about a month ago. Uh, very, very cool. That's what most of the apps that we build are usually Canvas applications. Model-driven applications have a certain kind of uh, flair to them, which we'll cover in today's webinar, and, and some really cool stuff you can do with it. If you are familiar with like salesforce.com or Dynamics, model-driven applications are going to feel a lot like uh, Apex apps or Dynamics apps. Actually, they, they are Dynamics apps. Okay, so what is the advantage of doing uh, Power Apps? Well, Power Apps is for building internal applications for your organization. So if you, this is not going to be for an application that you send to, you post on the web and have thousands of people connect to. This is going to be replacing, you know, those PDFs that you have. Or maybe you have an internal application that, that is, is kind of getting a little bit rusty right now. For example, we have this application at Pragmatic Works called our CMS application. And it's, it is an application we built over a decade in, in length. And uh, it, it's kind of our Frankenstein app that we always assign our poor junior, app, junior developer to. Well, that application, uh, we were able to convert most of the functionality in it, all the complex functionality in it, in about three or four days using Power Apps. The best thing about that was pretty much anybody knows Power Apps here. So it's, a, it's one that now goes from a very fragile application that was developed by you know, 20 different developers <laughs> over 10 years to a very stable application in Power Apps. So Power Apps gives you WYSIWYG control, so you don't have to know how to write .NET code. 
it, it, it does help in some areas we don't have that. You can actually build custom things for a higher end developer, but it's really meant for a citizen developer like yourself. So if you're a DBA and you want to build an app to go and scour your network and look for different things or replace paperwork for requisition forms or those kind of things, or if you're an analyst, all that, all those, those kind of roles, if you can do Power BI, you can do Power Apps. So it's very, very fine tooth control. So if you're a Power Apps developer, uh, Power BI, sorry, Power BI developer, you can also integrate Power Apps into Power BI or into Flow. It work, everything works cross-directional there. So I can put a Power BI report inside of Power Apps, or I can put a Power Apps app inside of Power BI. So it works bi-directional. It's a really cool way of doing things. The nice thing is it works across hundreds of connectors. This actually, this slide's a little bit out of date now. It's actually closer to 250 different connectors now. So they're adding more connectors all the time. So things like Salesforce.com or of course Dynamics. One of those connectors, and it, and it also works on premise as well. So on premises, excuse me. So if you have an on-prem uh, database, like a SQL Server database, or a Sybase database, or MySQL, uh, you just install the same on on uh, on the same data management gateway that you install for Power BI works for Power Apps as well. Now, once you build an application, it works cross-platform. So it works in the iOS, works on Windows, works on Android. It also works in the web and in SharePoint. It works in Dynamics as well. So sharing applications is just like sharing a document like you do inside of Office 365. Really easy to kind of build these apps. And what it looks like on your on the iPhone, for example, is you install the Power Apps app inside the iPhone. And you're gonna, once you sign in, you'll see a list of apps that are available to you, almost like an internal company store. And each of those could be business processes. There's also a Flow app and a Power app, Power BI app also. These are all native apps though. And you can also access it through the web as well, but the native applications give you a lot of extra cool stuff. All right, so that is a little bit about Power Apps in general. So now, what, is, what does this common data services do for us? So, Power Apps and Flow and Power BI all can interact with this thing called pa Common Data Services. Power Apps uses Common Data Services or CDS for apps. Now this gives you access to a in-place database you always have access to. So let's imagine, for example, you want to build a new app for time cards or for uh, doing a requisition for a new hat, for example, or a PC repair or whatever. Chances are, what with, with CDS, those tables have already been created for you. So what you'll do is you'll go over, open up powerapps.com, you'll go to data, and you'll see a list of entities that are available to you. These are a lot of the same entities that are available to you in Dynamics. As a matter of fact, there's, there's overlap there, right? So if I make a change to a record in Dynamics, it changes into CDS also. So this gives you access to a schema pretty, pretty made. Now you can customize that schema if you wish as well. So if you don't want to have to create a yet another customer entity, you can just tie into the CDS and you're already paying for that database with your Power Apps license. Again, this is going to require the P1 license to do this. But if you do, do this, you're essentially getting a, an Azure database. Right now it's Azure, it might change at some point, but you're getting an Azure database as part of your license and you're not having to pay for that Azure database separately. Now you can import data and synchronize data using Power Query to get you know synchronized across your ecosystem. Uh, if you build a business rule across it or to build calculations across it, it will apply to any application that touches it. That's one of the nice things, whether it be a Canvas application or a model-driven application, it's going to comply with all the business rules that you create. So some really cool stuff you can do inside that. So. It also has access to things called like business process flows. Now these are the ability to make it really obvious to your users what to do next. So for example, let me just kind of show you, let me hop out just so you can kind of visualize it. Cause the picture says a thousand words, I think on this. Uh, if I were to open up uh, this, this application right here and just open up a quick one, we'll be building this later today. You'll see the business process flow up top here. So again, this is just an, an easy way to enforce, uh, the internet is really slow right now, I'm gonna turn my camera off here, but this, this process flow you're seeing right here up top is, a, is an obvious way to say, where am I in, this, in, in my workflow right now? So this could be done for, for example, if you want to um, uh, have an onboarding process flow, where, okay, I, I, I verified they're a US citizen, I've 
to have a tax paperwork. Now I've done their um, enrollment and so healthcare and da 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 da. As each of these fields are filled out, it goes to the next step on the process. So you'll see here, okay, I've, I've, I'm waiting for approval for this laptop here, so I can't move to the next step. Let me go ahead and get that approval manually here and send it to the next stage. So this is, a, this is what business processes are all about. This is only available to you in model-driven applications. So it's kind of a snazzy way of, of doing that, uh, and it makes it really obvious when you break a process, okay? There's also server-side logic I mentioned before, like calculations and business rules and all those kind of things as well. Again, as you create those business rules, they work across any application that you happen to do. So these would be things like for creating calculations and all those kind of things. Now, there's a whole set of uh, nomenclature, a vocabulary we have to learn when we do these model-driven applications. So the first thing is an entity, and this equates to essentially a table in the common data services. So it empties a table, and then those, those tables have fields or columns inside of it. You can create relationships where the account entity can relate to an order entity, for example. Again, a lot of these are already created for you, so you're going to have to create uh, and extend it as you need it. There's also option sets, and these would be for pick lists or things like that where you have, um, hey, this order been approved, yes, no, or uh, what stage is this order in, or opportunity in? And that we, you know, hey, if they have won this opportunity, I've lost this opportunity, and so on. So that's that's a few of the things here around that. I have an interesting question here from from uh, Pramod also. What is the difference between Power Apps and Logic Apps? So Logic Apps is much more like a workflow inside of 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 of, of your process. So, so in other words, if I want to go through and say, hey, take if a record gets added here, then do all these these steps with it. Uh, Power Apps is an interactive application you're going to build, not a workflow, but it's an interactive application where your users can actually type data in, do data entry, those kind of things. Now, Power Apps can actually interact with workflows also. Now, Power Apps can interact with something that, that is built on top of Logic Apps called Microsoft Flow. So we'll actually be showing you some Microsoft Flows today. But it's a lot like Logic Apps. Microsoft, Microsoft Flow is just Logic Apps with a, with a fancier end-user UI on top of it. Hope that answers your question there. Okay, but the biggest difference there is interactivity or not. Where Flow and Logic Apps is much more of a workflow, Power Apps is more interactive. All right, so we're going to build an app, and we'll be using the App Designer for that app. And the first thing we'll do is we'll create a site map, and then create our forms, and then our views. So this is kind of kind of nomenclature we'll have around actually building this this application. Now we mentioned Pramod mentioned uh, Logic Apps again. Microsoft Flow is essentially Logic Apps. It has a, a, a much easier UI, and it also has things like a, a nice, a nice a native application for your iOS or Android also. We're gonna use this today to create things like workflows uh, uh, to approve the purchasing of a PC. So let's imagine you purchase a PC. Traditionally, I'd fill out paperwork, hand it to my manager, he'd sign it, hand it to his manager, sign it again, and then go over to accounting for our PC repair or whatever. So this is gonna be done automatically through Microsoft Flow. Again, this is very similar to Logic Apps as Pramod mentioned also. Okay, and that is our last slide. Well, almost our last slide for the day. So we're gonna hop out here and we're gonna go and do an end-to-end -end demo now. So the goal of this demo is going to be to build a application and I'll show you what the application looks like uh, also. And before we start that, I just wanna ask a few questions of you. Uh, what type of internal applications do you really see yourself building here? So this would be things like, hey, do you want to replace manual paperwork, like I mentioned before? Do you see a whole bunch of legacy applications? I mentioned that before also, like that uh, CMS application I mentioned. Or do you see yourself building some brand new applications with this, some new workflow that you might have that you didn't know you had? So I'll give you a few seconds to answer that one. Just kind of trying to find out a little more about yourself. And that's getting pretty darn close now. We're about 60%. About Everybody else is asleep right now. So we'll get that a few seconds here. All right, good enough. Let me go ahead and close that and share those results. Looks like most of you guys are looking at brand new applications for that. Now keep in mind the brand new applications, make sure they're, they're gonna be internal applications. Uh, they aren't gonna be applications you host on the web. Now you can, if you want, if you're an ISV, for example, you can build applications that you distribute to your customers and they host it inside of Power Apps also. So that's that, there's capability of that also. Uh, last question for you, and this will be my last one for the day. 
uh, is, is who manages power, the power platform in your environment? I'm kind of curious. We, we have this debate here. That's why I added this question here about who manages Power, power BI and Power Apps in, in organizations. This will help us solve a, solve a bet here at Pragmatic Works. We think it's, we think it's uh, the IT team, and so I'm kind of curious what, what it is in your case. It looks like my bet might be correct. So while, while you guys are answering that, we have a question from Tricia here. Uh, would Power Apps be a good replacement for on-prem SharePoint list and approval workflow? So uh, it, it can be. So when, in Power Apps, you can actually overwrite uh, data entry forms for SharePoint. So you can use SharePoint still as your, as your, as your data source, and it could be an entry point for getting data in that list. So if you don't want your customers or your, your internal customers to see that SharePoint list, because uh, it's kind of ugly or whatnot, or not very user friendly. You can build intuitive applications to get data in there. Also, if they hit the edit button in that list, you can you can tr you can trick out a nice application and it launches that application instead of the, the built-in application. So it's a good, great question there. Also, um, does everybody that need, has the application need a license? Yes, everyone will need a license of Power Apps to to do that. I mean, close this real quick. Uh, now that could be, if you have a Canvas application, could just be the, the, the cheapy version, right? Could be the Power Apps for Office, which you already, chances already have. Um, and if you're using premium connectors, it all depends on how you want, to, what, what kind of data sources you're gonna be connecting to. All right, so it looks like uh, IT does win here. So, uh, IT is managing about 70% of your environment here for, for the Power Platform. Dev is the other lucky winners here, and you got the off side. So, and 5% have the poor, poor guy sitting in the corner doing it in his, in his uh, uh, other, the other, the, 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 the the other guy doing it. All right, good enough. So let's go ahead and, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to uh, extend our NT series. So let's imagine we don't have access to create an Azure database, and the application we'll be using today looks like this. Let me go ahead and open this app and play this. So this is a Canvas application. You can see this is the environment that you create Power Apps in. If you're building a Canvas application, now keep in mind that the topic of this top of this webinar is all about model-driven applications. So we'll show the differences here in a moment. So this is what a Canvas application looks like. I have pixel-perfect kind of control of what I'm of what I'm doing right now. Uh, so if I want to go into Lenovo here and get it and request a new Lenovo laptop, I'll go ahead and say, well, really, what's the difference of these two laptops? Compare those. Now, this app that we're looking at here took about uh, about half an hour to an hour to build. Very, very simple application to build once you kind of know the process of doing it. Now, what we're missing here is a form right here to actually hit the submit button to request this, this S300 laptop. So that's the first thing we're gonna be doing this and this is actually creating a common data service entity to accept that data. Then we're gonna create a model-driven application that looks a little bit like this to actually view that request. Now, this is a model-driven application. It feels a lot more like Salesforce or in this case, dynamics. So let's see the two difference here. It's one is we don't have control of this other than that, hey, we want this show this field here and what we want that to look like. Where this, we have a lot of control, but we spend a lot more time kind of building this, building that app that you saw out. So this takes a little bit more time to build, where the model driven application might take us 15, 20 minutes to do. Uh, here's a great question also. Is Power Apps a good replacement for VB with access forms? It is the perfect replacement for that. And you can point it to Access if you want to. I would point it to SQL Server or Azure in my case. But uh, it is a perfect replacement for uh, a, a VBA application or a form inside of uh, Access. Or it is definitely the replacement for InfoPath. InfoPath is going to die, and this is a replacement for InfoPath. And they are adding a lot to this now, by the way, also. Uh, you're going you're to find that this Power Apps is as, oh gosh, it's almost 4x the growth over last year. So we're seeing a lot more, uh, a lot more pieces around this that we did not see. All right, let me go ahead and, and close out. I apologize. All right, there we go. So our first step here, we would have to do to create the order entry form for this is to create a database table, right? We'd create some kind of table inside of Azure, or you mentioned before, Access to actually receive this data. Now, in our case, we're gonna use CDS to do that. So if I go back to Power Apps in general here, so powerapps.com, and I'm gonna to go to data, and you'll see entities here. Now, these entities are, again, tables, they're like tables inside of a SQL Server database. However, uh, this is gonna be entities inside of our common data services. Now, most of these were created automatically for me when I created the CDS database. So we're seeing things like orders and and approvals and appointments, 
These are all things, addresses and accounts, accounts are customers. These are all things that were just automatically here. Uh, organizations and, and customers, employees and phone calls. This is the kind of stuff that you'll find just natively here and you just extend it, okay? Now we're going to go ahead and add a new entity right here and we'll do a few pieces in that and then we'll go over and actually create a, a brand new one also. So we'll call this just how a PC order, oh, okay, excuse me, PC order. And I hit the new entity button in the top left in case you missed that. What is the primary key for this? So I'll create one called PC order ID, something like that, okay? Do we want to have attachments? Do we want to describe this in any way? Do you want to have any kind of uh, any kind of extra metadata? We can do that right here. Do you also want to enable this entity for offline access? We'll, we'll do that later also. So we'll hit create. Now, sometimes I get a little error here, so we'll see what happens. Uh, that all depends on my CPU right now, and that's what I'm going to get right now. So I'll try saving one more time. If that doesn't work, we'll go ahead and create it one more time. Okay, that is going to be a problem right now. This is an error. I, 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 my, my CS environment is, I think, kind of funky right now, but I bet you if I type it again, PC order, oh, I'm going to actually put spaces here because this is actually the display name right here. Um, so the display name can, can have spaces in it and it can be more user friendly. So we'll call this just PC order ID and we'll try this one more time. Okay. Typically, the second time it opens up, oh, and it's, it's giving me prompts. So let, let me try one last time a different name. I think I might have an entity out there with that name. So let me kind of give it one more name here. I'll call it just PC order webinar. There we go. And I misspelled that, but you get the idea. Okay. You know, it's funny, you, tr you uh, diagnose this hundred times in, in, uh, uh, in the morning to make sure the webinar goes flawlessly. And then you get this error that happens, you know, live, of course. So I just, one of those things that happens sometimes I could diagnose it for you live, but it would take five, 10 minutes to do. And I don't want to do that. So it's actually provisioned perfectly. Now, I think the problem was I already had an entity, um, uh, already out there with that same name. So I was, I was running it over and over again, practicing for this webinar. All right. So we have our primary key now. So now we want to create a few more fields or columns out there. So let's go ahead and add a new field. Um, and let's go ahead and let's go ahead and give this uh, who's a requester here in this case. All right. Who's actually want, who actually wants, I can't remember if it's an OR and ER. It looks like OR. I know nope, I am wrong. ER. All right. So who's a requester? Who wants this laptop? I'm going to make this because we're in CDS. We have things like references to customers, for example. We have references to currencies, and it feels a lot like SQL Server, but it's different, even though it is SQL Server behind the scenes. I want to make this an email address in my case. It will be searchable, and you'll see some other stuff in here eventually also. Let's go ahead and let's get the price of the, of the request as well. I'll make this one a currency one. Now, this is going to be a little special when I go ahead and click currency, hit done. You'll notice that what happens here, and when I hit save, watch what happens when I hit save here. It's going to spin up two entities and some extra stuff for currencies because currencies are special. Currencies have, well, I'm sorry, uh, pricing has currencies, right? And there's exchange rates and there's potentially exchange rates, potentially. There's potentially you want to see it in pounds and I want to see it in dollars and you know he wants to see it in rupees and so on and so on. Because that, it, it actually supports that out of the box. So the minute I say currency, it allows me to have a multi-currency environment because of that. So that, that's why you're seeing those, uh, those extra entities there also. Uh, let's create a few more here also. We'll call it, uh, let's do approval dates. Okay, again, spaces are allowed. Of course, I have it. I have a hard time actually using spaces sometimes. Approval date, and then let's also create one called uh, department con contribution. So department contribution. All right, so this is gonna be how much of this, of this uh, amount is a department going to pay for versus a company paying for. So let me go ahead and put that as a currency. And on this one in particular, let's go ahead and make this a little more interesting. Let's go ahead and hit the add button and let's make this a calculation. The minute I wanna do that, it's gonna ask me to save the entity again and, and then it's gonna give me a calculation editor. So this is gonna be, I want the department to pay for 20% of this PC request. So it's gonna open up a calculation editor. Now, some of these editors you'll find are using the old Dynamics 365, and some of them have been modernized. This is an example of one that's a little bit more awkward in some cases. You'll see in the background here, 
this editor is waiting for us to kind of finish up. So once it's hit, hit done, once we're done. So we'll go ahead and do this. Now we could say, hey, if it's this kind of order, you're above $3,000, so the employee is going to spend 50% now versus 20%. So we could get an if then condition also. But in our case, we'll keep it really simple. We'll just say, hey, we got a price already. There's my price. And we want to multiply that times 25% to make the department pay 25%. So there we go. So now this field is going to be an automated field where the department is going to pay 25% and that's where we're going to store that. So I'll hit save and close and then I'll hit done and we'll see again. We'll have two entities here for department contribution. Again, the entities here, we're seeing the, see the base one and then the regular one. The base one is where we're kind of, we're storing our data and then we, we localize the currency and then one you seeing above it as well. All right, so we're sending the price. Any kind of currency always comes in two different columns, and it spins up two columns, and you're going to edit this one right here, okay? So we can keep on going, but let me show you one that's a little bit more uh, flushed out. Actually, before I do that, I want to create a rule also around this. So let's go ahead and you'll see relationships. These are like one-to-many relationships where we can kind of say, hey, here's the employee that's making the request, and it relates to our employee entity, and so on. Under business rules though, this is where we can go ahead and specify what the column must look like or what are we gonna do with this? Let me go ahead and add a quick business rule. I guess opening up that, that unusual interface here, we're gonna see it, I think it's the modern one. <clears throat> this, I think it's actually Dynamics 365. So this is going to be a, a, a business rule editor where we go through and we're gonna, we're gonna create a, a new way of doing this. So, all right, so let's go ahead and give our order at our, our name here. Let's go ahead and set uh, ship date. You know what, I didn't create the date actually. I can't do this yet. All right, sorry about that. I forgot to create our uh, actual date that we're gonna set here. So let me go back over to fields and create uh, two last fields. I wanna take a few seconds to do that. Uh, I have approval date. I need to create uh, estimated ship date here. There we go. And that will be a date time. And it looks like I have requester, I have estimated ship date, I have approval date, but I made it a time, a text, instead of actually uh, a date. So let me go ahead and set that to a date time. Oh, and this is one of those cases where I'm gonna have to kind of delete that entity real quick. Okay, and then create again. I'll call this just uh, date approved. Give it a different name because I don't want to have to go through into that. So we're going to build a rule on this. It says, hey, after this is approved, we're going to estimate it's going to take us two weeks to actually receive this item. So I've got that date approved now. Uh, it is a date time. Let me go ahead and save this entity, which should go ahead and take that slash that we're seeing right there off. Okay. There we go. And refresh it. There we go. So take that slash off. Everything's been deployed now. So now the entity is now available to us for other areas. So let me go over to my business rule one more time here and let's create that business rule again. It takes a few seconds to launch this again. Uh, and this is a visual designer for doing business rules. So it's much like uh, you can do things like you can do in, in SQL Server with defaults, for example. But we're going to, you can create a really elaborate kind of workflow for business rules. Ours can be pretty simple. It says, hey, if the approver date has some data inside of it, then we're going to go ahead and set the other date to, to 14 days. So let's go ahead and create a condition. This condition will be called uh, you know, approval date, approval date. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this in a moment. So ignore that I have, I have a crummy uh, spelling right now. All right, we just wanna make sure that there is an entity called uh, approved, I think called date approved, and that it actually contains data. So let's go ahead and uh, that actually has data. So if it has data, we would apply that. We'll see that, that that now has changed. I want to go ahead and set a new field to be equal to something else here. So let's go ahead and actually set the value now. So we're going to go ahead and set the field value. There we go. I'm going to put it right here. So if this checks out, then we want to go ahead and set the field, which is going to be, um, I think it was called estimated ship date. And that value is going to be that value set, it's gonna be a formula. And I want that formula to be based on data approved, and I'm gonna add 14 days to it. So again, the goal of this, of course, you could have done this a lot faster in T-SQL, right? But the goal is not to replace T-SQL here. 
The goal is to make it where a business, a higher end business user or an analyst could easily buy, write their own rules. And now that I have that rule created, I can go ahead and validate that rule, make sure it's gonna work. Um, but this rule is going to apply no matter where the application is. So that's what the nice thing about this is. See, it did validate. We can go ahead and activate it now and save this off. There we go. And we're all set to go ahead and close this down. So this is a, an easy way to kind of create rules that can be applied to other ones. Uh, are there drop downs boxes? This was what uh, uh, um, Lisa's asking here also. Absolutely, those, those are option sets we created earlier. So we go ahead and activate this rule real quick. Uh, those are the option sets we created earlier and I'll show you where those are at also. You can absolutely do that though. And I'll show you, actually now we have barely done this. Let's go ahead and create a more, let's get a com more complete version of this that, that's all kind of flushed out. So let me go ahead and close this. That's now been activated. So now we have that entity now. I'm going to hit done here. We'll see that business rule now in place. I didn't give it a good name, but you get the idea here. All right, so see, uh, now it's Lisa's question here. See the option sets? That's where you'll create those universal pick lists that you can use in, in different entities. Or you can it's basically look up tables. Or you can just create a, a local entity that only that, a local option set that only that entity can see also. So matter of fact, let's go ahead and go back here and kind of see what that would look more of a com more complete one would look like. So I'm gonna go back to entities and you're gonna see one called device order right here. So this is our, our complete version of it here also. All right, so if I look at this, you're gonna see all the goodies. And yeah, this is, I have a few people asking here, uh, there's a few people that are um, asking about recordings. Yes, this is being recorded. It'll be on YouTube, on our YouTube channel later. Uh, can you do the same thing with Canvas mode? Yes, uh, so that's a great question. So once we have the CDS done the way we're doing, this is actually a more of a complete version. And you're seeing things like two option sets here, yes, no questions and all that. Let's go ahead and see how we can integrate this into our, our Canvas application. To um, it's Adrian's asking that question. So if you're using a, a, a CDS inside of the Canvas application, it gives you access to this full database, even though we're not gonna even use a model driven application yet. So let's see how we do that. So when we had that application you saw back here, let's see here, where'd it go? Here it is. And we wanted to create a form that once I was looking at this idea pad or this S300, I want people to actually go ahead and go submit the data. So let's go ahead and compare those two. I'm gonna hold the Alt key down and, and click compare. Come on. I think my video might be, there we go. And I'm gonna put the form right here to the right of this. So to do that, we're gonna, we're in a Canvas application mode right now. I'm gonna go to insert and I'm gonna put just a quick form in here. And it's gonna be an edit form. Now, one thing I've already done ahead of time is, let me go ahead and move this over here. Here we go. One thing I've already done ahead of time is I've created a, I've, I've created a data source and it's pointing over to our, our tables here. But let me go ahead and create a new one here. I'm gonna to point to CDS. Again, if you have P1 license, you'll, you'll see CDS as one of your options inside the data sources. So there's my common data service right here. It's gonna ask me what entity do I wanna to point to? You'll see all the entities that we already looked at before, including our one we called, um, I forgot what it was called, has the word Brian in it, I believe. So let me go ahead, our webinar. There it is, PC order webinar. So when I hit connect, it's gonna now pull that entity over. It's gonna change our data source to point to that. And then it's gonna choose some terrible fields that it thinks are the right fields to go with that we're gonna to have to go and fix now. So essentially what we've done here, if you replace the whole Azure part of this, or the whole creating a database part, we've, we've created a database with very low friction, and now we're off the races. Now this, this lag you're seeing right now, is likely because of my video. So let me go ahead and turn off the, the video here. I, I like seeing you guys, but unfortunately, there we go. That will probably speed up our bandwidth now. And while that's doing its thing here, okay, come on, there it goes. Okay, so now it, it went and created those forms and it knows it created some pretty terrible field names. It, it, it thinks attachments are worthwhile and all that. So let's go ahead and simplify this down. Let me go ahead and, and just remove some of these fields that we know we don't need. We don't, for our requisition, we don't need an attachment. Um, we don't need data approved because they, they're not gonna be the one approving it. Uh, we don't need an estimated ship date. Uh, we do need a price, we need a requester. Uh, we'll need an order ID. Let me go ahead and remove this guy here. 
and we don't need record created on. So we'll, we'll just start something with something very, very simple like this. We, of course, would have more fields and all that, but you get the idea, right? So our next step is to go ahead, we've done that now, and I wanna populate this. We wanna get the requester in here, for example. So I wanna find out who is signed in. Well, once we do a form like this, first of all, it's going to how am I thought, kind of unlock this by, by going to advance and hitting unlock. And I want to set the default value to who is signed in right now. So inside the Canvas designer we're seeing right now, this Power Apps designer, up top you see default, and it's set to parent.default. So I want to go through and find out who you're signed in as right now. So to do that, I can do user, open, close parenthesis, and do dot, and it tells me in IntelliSense here, what do you want to get out of it? Well, I want to get the email address for that. And now you'll see my email address popped in inside that area. Now we could hide it now at this point because it's not really needed, but we may let the user know that, hey, we know who you are and, and we're, we're gonna go ahead and, and make, the, make the request on your behalf. So we could do that also. We can also go through and, and disable it to where it, people can see it, but maybe it's not, it's not actually uh, enabled. So we can disable that now to where it looks like it's kind of there, but it's, you can't touch it. You can also make it in more of a view mode like this. And this is display mode property on that field. In view mode, it just shows that it's, it's there, it's been requested, you can't override it, you can't even see that the field, but you can see it's there. Okay, so that, that, that's kind of a useful way to let letting people know, hey, I got your back here. The price, well, the price also is being selected from over here on the left here, right? We know the price already. So I'm gonna select this price here, Again, I'm going to unlock it, and the default value this time is going to be the value of whatever item you selected. Well, on the left here, we have this, 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 this kind of repeater here, this gallery that you have over here. And I think if I look at that, I forgot the gallery is called. It's called Compare List Gallery. So I will type in, all right, Compare List Gallery. There it is. And I want, I want the item that you selected. So as you can imagine, I'll do dot, and it kind of write, writes itself here. There's that dot selected, and I type in dot again, and what item do you want from that left gallery here? Well, I want the price. There we go. Now I've selected this, this Lenovo right here, so now I'm seeing the price at 369. Again, I can go ahead and, and tell this that, hey, I don't need to see this. Go ahead and override this and hide it, for example, turn it to visible of the defaults, and it kind of goes away also. So lots of stuff we can do to kind of tweak this. The last one is the ID. This is the ID of, of, of what you wanna, what, what, what device are you requesting here? Again, just like the last one, I'll go to our compare gallery here, compare list gallery, dot selected, and let's do our device name in this case. All right, so we'll have a Lenovo S300 now. All right, so we've got our form now created. We can of course do a lot more. We'd have to have the comments in this and make it a lot more uh, fancy, but we'll stop here for the time being. Now we need a button to actually submit this data. So let's go ahead and insert a new button right here. And see how easy this is? Just wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. All right, so we have built this, this part of the application in just a few minutes here. I'll go ahead and call this submit. Now, when somebody selects this, our default property here on select is set to false, which means you can't do anything with it. You can click it all you want, but nothing's going to happen. So let's go ahead, and as you can imagine, in our case, we'll type in submit form, and it kind of writes itself here. What form do you want to submit? Well, we have a great form name right here called form two, which we just created. Not a good name, but the idea. And now that we've done that, if I hit the alt key down and I actually hit the submit button, You'll see our Lenovo, oh, it's a problem. I bet you it's because I didn't have the primary key selected. PC order ID. Let's try this Lenovo next to it here. Also, when you first hit this form, you may also want to make sure that uh, it actually is edit mode. Notice when I hit the play button here, the form goes away. That's because it thinks that we want to edit now versus do a new form. So I'm gonna go ahead and change when you first enter the screen, I want the form to go to new mode. So I'll say new form, there we go. And which form do I wanna do? Form two, there we go. So now when I hit submit, when I, now when I hit the play button, we'll see it opens it up. Actually, I have to go out and come back. Let me go ahead and do that real quick. Let me go ahead and clear the selection. Let's start with a Sony this time. I'm feeling, uh, I'm gonna go expensive here. Let's go that duo right there. All right, let's select our duo. You notice everything's red right now? That's because it's over your price limit. 
Now, when I hit submit, it's going to fail, I believe. Uh, I, when it turns gray like that, that means it's actually submitting. It's done its job. Actually, it worked this time. So it, it was definitely a transient error that I had. I hadn't fit, fit it fixed up on the previous screen. So there we go. We have our order now in. So now, where, where can we see that order in our entity? So if I go back to our entity over here, okay, this is what we just created. We called it something like a webinar, I believe. Oh, this is this is the other one. Let me try. Let me try our entity again. And I've got, I think it's called webinar, PC order webinar, I think I called it. Okay, wait for it to open up real quick. Okay. And I think we call it PC order. There it is, webinars. So how can I see this data? Well, one way to see the data is just kind of test to make sure it's working. You can go to the data tab right here. And we're seeing, yep, our Sony Vio Duo is already in. And we can see the record is actually in. You also, by the way, have the ability under integrations here, data integrations, is to bring data in from outside sources if you want to as well. That's another option you have. So if you want to have a list of employees that you want to load this, this entity from, from SAP, then you could do that as well. But now we've created a basic Canvas application. Just to kind of flush this out a little bit more, let me show you what the complete one looks like and you can kind of feel, get a feel for what the possibilities are. So I have this device procurement. And by the way, this is part of our, um, one of our Power Apps classes called App in a Day. So I'll open this up. I think this is the app at least. Oh, no, that's not it. That's, that's the Canvas app. Excuse me. That's the uh, Maldor application. It's right here, device ordering application. There it is. Okay, so this is what a complete one will feel like. I will give it an, a, um, um, pick a, pick an app, a device of some sort. There we go. Okay, we'll go Toshiba this time. And I got some issues there, as you can see. Okay, I haven't, I haven't fixed my alignment. All right, got my approve. My, now, the approver here, this is kind of cool. What you can do with the approver is you can automatically look in Active Directory for who is a manager for B9 at Pragmatic Works and send a request to the manager. So I'll go ahead and put my comments inside of this. I'll submit my device request. And then it's off the races. Now, I should, in reality, go back and hit, hit and automatically go back to the previous screen or acknowledge it, but I have not finished that part of the app yet. But all in all, this took about uh, two hours to build, maybe an hour to build this whole thing uh, with an explanation. So now, let's build our first model-driven application so you can see how easy it is. One thing to note here is that as soon as I did that, by the way, it kicked a workflow off. And that workflow just sent a request saying, hey, do you approve this, la this laptop purchase? So we'll come back to that a little bit later also. But what that email looks like, just so you know, is I'll pull it up once it comes in. It's actually ringing my phone right now. There it is. It looks like this. I'll put the, uh, the, the approver on the screen right now. This is Microsoft Flow. And what it looks like is I can go through here and say, all right, here's a request that came in. This guy's requesting this device. Here's the comments he put about why he needs that device. I can go ahead and hit the approve, approve button right here and add my own comments right there. And when I add my own comments, hit submit, it's going to go the next step in the process. This is called Microsoft Flow that's doing this for us. Now, when I hit the approve, it actually rang my phone, it rang my Apple Watch, and it actually sent me an email, and it appeared on my website as well. So all that happened, and essentially what it looks like is this. When a record's created in CDS, Common Data Services, it's waiting for approval from the manager, and then if yes, then go ahead and do this update the record to approved, and then send an email saying, hey, you are approved. Congratulations, you are the now owner of this new fancy new laptop. So I now get this email you're seeing right here that just came in. And I got the sheep I just wanted, this one just wanted is now approved. And the approver comment looks like this. Estimated ship dates all set and all those kind of goodies are all done. So this is the, this is the possibility of what you can do in the Power Platform. Now in the model-driven application, it looks like this. So we're going to create a brand new application here, and it's going to be a brand new application from a model-driven app here from blank. Okay, we're going to give it a terrible name here. Once it comes up, here we go. Fancy name, and then we'll hit done. Now, one thing I didn't click there is I should have clicked, hey, this is actually a uh, available for offline viewing and all those kind of things also. 
This is a designer, the app designer for a model-driven application. It is vastly different. And one thing I forgot to add is I forgot to add an entity here, but we'll go and, and do that in a moment here also. I forgot to add, actually, when, I, when it prompted me for the application, it should have, it actually asked me what entities I want to do. So my first step I want to do is, is let's go ahead and add that entity. Let's go ahead and select this entity right here. Here we go, and add that. And the entity is going to be our webinar one we just created. You know what, let's, let's kind of step, take a step back here and actually create that from scratch here. Because I can't believe I just actually made that mistake here. Okay, let's go and create that entity one more time, model driven application. Good enough. It's gonna save us a lot of time if, we have, if I just actually read the screen that comes up. Uh, there we go. And okay, actually it's not gonna ask there, sorry. Okay, so the first step you wanna do is, is build a site map. So the site map, you're seeing the little red X right here, is what, what does the, the, the navigation of the app look like? So in our case, we're gonna have a new area, and just so we can keep it clear, I'll go ahead and call this just uh, my area here. So you can kind of see later in the application what the area looks like, and I'll call this just my group. This is just a grouping of different uh, entities. And then right here for sub area, I'm gonna go ahead and point to the entity right here that we just created. What was that called? Uh, PC, I'll do device order for our first one. That's fine. Is there a dashboard you wanna show for this? Is there an image you wanna show? No, I'll keep it all simple. Are you passing parameters in? Let's keep it really simple. And then I'll create one more sub area as well. This one's gonna be the one that we just created a little moment ago. So at least you can kind of see the before and after image. This one is gonna be called PC order webinar. And it is also going to be an entity as well. There we go. PC order. There we go. Good enough. And we are off to the races here. So let's go ahead and, and save and close this. And now as soon as we've done that, our entity is actually showing up down below now as well. Now it's going to ask us things like, what form do you want to show a customer? Well, you'll, we'll show you forms in a moment here, but I want to show the main form. I don't want to show all forms. Just give, me, just give them this one form to actually view. And let's do the same thing over here. I'm going to turn off the all and just show the main form. We can also show a quick one only, uh, and I'll show you what it looks like in a moment as well. So we're going to go ahead and, and save and close that. Actually, before I save and close that, I should have actually viewed the application so you can kind of see that. But we'll go over here and, and see it the same way here. Okay, so here's our app we just created 12 seconds ago. Let's go ahead and play this. And now you'll see what an app looks like. Oh, that is interesting. Oh, I know, I know the problem. I did not actually deploy that app. So I saved it, but I did not actually deploy it. So let's go ahead and edit this one more time. That's a common error, not a very, not a very clean error message as you, as you saw, but, not, but one nonetheless. So let's go ahead and validate the app, app works, no warnings, and then we'll hit the publish button right here. This is gonna send the app out now for, for play for everyone else. So let's hit the play button. And now we'll go ahead and be able to see our app uh, elsewhere. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is what our app is going to look like. It's going to be very, very simple. I didn't really, I at least spent, what, maybe 30 seconds, minute and a half on it. Uh, and the first thing you'll notice is we're seeing a list of all the active device orders. This, this is from the device uh, table. Here's the one we just created a moment ago, though. This is our PC order one. And we got this Sony Vio right here, uh, this guy right here. So very, very easy. There is our, our, uh, our my area we did it before. There's a group that we created. There's a sub area. So this kind of shows you where everything belongs once you create the areas up top, groups right here, and PC area right here. Now, what can we do with this now that we've done it? Well, first of all, I want to go ahead and add a few more entities to this guy here. So right now we only have um, the name of the PC and when it was created. I want to see more in that though. So to do that, I'll go over here and inside of Power Apps, I'll go back to the entity again. I think I've already got the entity open. Let's see. Do I have it open? No, I do not. Okay, no problem. So I'm gonna go over to the entity here and I wanna go ahead and, and, and influence the view of what it looks like. So keep in mind, once we create this stuff, it applies to any application using it. So my entity right here, let's go inside of it. And I'm gonna go inside of views. And this is my active view that we're looking at right now on the other screen. So let's go ahead and change this so we can go ahead and see what the, uh, the repercussions of that change are in the application. So here, we'll go ahead and select this guy. Hopefully it comes up a little faster than that. Okay, and I wanna put, hey, when's the date approved on this? And maybe the estimated ship date and the price, okay, and so on and so on. I'll go ahead and hit publish. 
I should hit shape, save first, but you get the idea. And as soon as that publishes comes back, I should be able to go over here, hit the refresh button, and then our entity should now look like I, um, what you saw the other screen looked like. The other thing is the forms. So once I have this done, the form of how, of how you actually want to add the data and edit the data is going to be the next thing to edit. So here is this one. There it goes. We have the new ones already created. If I select a Sony VAIO, you'll see I only have like one column in here. That's not very useful at all, is it? So to, to edit this guy, we'll go back over here again. I hit done. Go to forms. And the same thing over here. This is the main information one. This is the form I said I wanted to show earlier. So I hit the main one and just drag the fields over that you wish. So this one's a pretty easy one. The last one we can do, I think I'll just, I'll add one or two things here so we can kind of see it. This has all been modern, modern interface through recently here. So let's go ahead and pop in maybe the price of the laptop once it comes up. Come on. <laughs> and you can, of course, influence it, put dashboards in here, all sorts of good stuff in here. There's my price. Let's find the requester. Let's drag that where you want to drag it. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's a very, very easy way to kind of build this stuff out, though, isn't it? Uh, date requested and so on and so on. So again, I'll, I'll go ahead and publish this. And once you publish this, that is now available for any application using it. Now, we already built a fresh application, right? And because we built a fresh application and we pointed to an existing entity, one of the cool things we have we can do, let me refresh this real quick so you can kind of see. So now we'll see, I, I, I have to refresh the whole page actually, but you get the idea. But once we've done this now, because he pointed to an existing entity here, that was the, the device order one, all the work I've done already on the entity is already here. Here's the columns we just did. So in a device order, check out this one. It's a little, a little more mature in this case. So I select the, uh, at the um, Acer here. Now we're seeing all this stuff I've already done once. I didn't do this, have to do this again though. Because I pointed to this existing entity, it's already available to me here. So now how do we do this stuff up top here? We're going to find that is going to be under flows. And you'll see it under called business processes. Oh, come on. Uh, business process flow. And let me show you an existing one that's already created. So you don't have to kind of watch me do this from scratch. because We're down a little, a little on time. So essentially what you do is you drag and drop these things over. When I hit add right here, for example, you say, no, I want to create a new stage in my workflow. Or do I want to create a condition? So for example, if a laptop is above a certain dollar figure, in my case, $1,000, I'm going to add this one extra stage you're seeing right here, where I'm going to request, hey, has the capital been approved for that? So I'm at making sure that that data steps actually has data. So I'm requesting that, hey, this data field must is required at that stage. Uh, this first step, as a, the, the device has been requested, here are the three columns, that I, or three fields, I want to make sure are filled out before you can go to the next stage. So, for example, if I'm looking at this Acer right here, you're only seeing the four steps here. But if I go back to device orders and I pick a more expensive device like this guy right here, uh, $1,800, now we're seeing that capital approved step now is in place. So we'll go over here, we'll select it and say, yeah, the capital approved is now uh, set. So that'll be the next stage. So, and so on. So this is kind of forcing you to kind of go through a proper workflow. It's a really nice way if you have that kind of requirement for your application. For paperwork, though, this makes a lot of sense, right? So you kind of force an onboarding process. Here's a supplier ID that, that came in. Here's the ship date that we're expecting that that order comes in and hit next. So it kind of forces you to kind of follow a workflow and, and, and everybody kind of go the same process. So this is what model-driven applications look like. They're they're very clean form-based applications versus Canvas applications, which are you know pixel perfect, you design all this. You can design the same stuff you're seeing right here in a Canvas application. This requires more work. And you can build workflows like this in Canvas applications. But this hopefully gives you spark some ideas in you. You can see that from this, we integrated Flow and we integrated using uh, uh, for approvals. And those approvals you saw right here, so you're seeing when I look at this, I can see what's been approved. That, that's the one we rejected a little bit ago. These have been approved and so on. So we can see here uh, easily how we can integrate things like Flow into Power Apps also. And just because we're happy to use a Canvas application, 
we are a, a, a model driven application, you can actually integrate Canvas right side by side with this as well. So you can have Canvas applications living inside of model driven applications also. So this is a very one on one session on this, but we'll cover more uh, in our we cover more in our classes, of course, and we also cover more uh, inside of future webinars as well, as well as our um, upcoming event that we're doing, the uh, business application. I'm sorry, the uh, uh, the stuff that we have coming up, you can find our homepage at pragmaticworks.com. Let me go to our slides one more time so you can kind of wrap up. So in this, you saw a whole bunch of really the goodness that you can do inside of this. Now, one of the things that you may ask, well, why do I care about Power Apps? I'm a, I'm a Power BI guy. One of the cool things is Power Apps uh, developers are definitely on the demand right now and on the rise. It's hard to find them right now. So your average pay it, for your for your higher end power apps developers, keep mind this, these are ones that actually know what they're doing. They're more senior developers. Uh, they're in that 100k range already. Uh, this is based on ZipRecruiter. So one of the things we do at Pragmatic Works is we do have this offering called Shared Development. So make sure you make you aware of it. Also, this is where you can you, you know you want to do power apps. You know you want to like, basically replace some paper operations, but you don't want to hire a full time developer and you have just enough to work for maybe a week of work a month. Basically, what we do is we, 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 we will do that for you. We come on, come on board and we help you. You get the same developer every month and for you know, six months or a year or you know, whatever you need, we basically act as your developer for that. And these guys know all about Power Apps, Power BI, Patent Flow, and they do everything I've done on this webinar today. Just they do it for you uh, for one week a month or two weeks a month based on what you need. But ultimately, you can, you can bring on a scope creep and just kind of say, I have a mountain of apps I want to get done. We help you get those apps done. So that's one of the requests that we ask in the, in the, um, in the survey results at the end. If that interests you, let us know. Just do that in the survey results, and we can help you on that. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me at my email address uh, on the front slide here, B9 at Pragmatic Works. You can also uh, throw a Twitter at me also if you like as well, at, at Brian Knight. Well, I know we're out of time now, but thank you so much for joining us. It uh, looks like our questions, uh, we kind of answered most of our questions now. Uh, if you have any ones, I'll hang out for a few minutes here, but it looks like uh, I've covered most of them at this point. Can you do the same thing with Molly? Yep, I answered his. And this, this session was recorded also, of course, for those that are asking that as well. All right, well, thank you for the few hundred people that came today. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please do email me at bnight at pragmaticworks. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye. All right, thanks, Brian. And like Brian said, this will be recorded. Um, so you guys should receive an email link tomorrow. And all of our past webinars, if you guys are looking for anything that's archived, it is on YouTube. But you guys will receive the link to this webinar tomorrow in your email. Thanks so much for joining again, guys. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Bye-bye.